Amen. Good morning. What a glorious day. Woo. We are going to be in the Old Testament again this morning. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then 10 and 11. We're continuing our series on modern day idolatry. Modern day idolatry. Uh, the title is today, The Idols of Pleasure. Idols of Pleasure today. Uh, as Jared made the announcement earlier, we uh, have an opportunity to bless our teachers at Pinewood again. And so if you can, please sign up. We need all, all of you that can cook or provide something. Uh, we want to really bless our Pinewood teachers and staff and everybody there. That is Wednesday. And at the end of the service, we have a wonderful update on our paid in full. Um, that will be memorable for each of you. It's going to be a great day. Um, last week, we talked about the fertile ground for idols, right? And the, the fertile ground for every idol begins with our hearts. All idols take root in our heart, and that's where they grow. And so Solomon warned us and, 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 and implored us to guard our hearts, because out of it, is the source of life. And so we talked about that last week and how the Word of God is the, the weed killer. The Word of God will come in and replace the idols that we have made. And so we have to uproot our idols. We have to ask the Lord, show us our idols. And then secondly, Lord, give us the strength to lay them at your feet. So, uh, Samuel, in that third point last week, Samuel uh, the Israelites had followed every idol, and the, they had become idolaters, and, and finally the Lord had gotten a hold of them. And they wanted to lay all of their idols down, and, and Samuel said, lay them down. And that invitation is for us today too. Whatever idols we have taken for ourselves, we need to lay those down at the feet of Christ. Because the idols are the things that they seem good on the outside, but they always lead to destruction. Always. Today, we're going to start looking at the issues of the heart. We're going to look at real things today. Things that are uncomfortable. Things that will make you and us and me uncomfortable. Because that's what we need. Right? We need to understand what the truth of the Word of God says. And, and how it applies to us. Now, I want to just go back for a moment to, to review... You see, an idol is anything, something, someone, uh, it could be a group of people, it could be all kinds of things, but it is something that people worship, that we worship, or we crave, or we seek, or we trust more than we do God, or we desire instead of God. And we have to be careful, because as I said before, is that most of our idols are actually an inherently good things. But we take those good things and blessings of the Lord and we begin to focus on the, the blessing instead of the one who provided the blessing. That's when idols become real in our life. And they're sneaky. They're extremely sneaky. Before you know it, you'll, you'll, you'll welcome an idol into your heart before you know it. And, and that's why we have to get into the Word so that the, the Lord can uproot those things in our life. Join me as we read God's Word, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. I said to myself, go ahead, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy what is good. But it turned out to be futile. I said about laughter, it is madness. And about pleasure, what does this accomplish? I explored with my mind how to let my body enjoy life with wine and how to grasp folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom until I could see what is good for people to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. Verse 10, all that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. This was my reward for all of my struggles. 
When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. King Solomon was the wisest person that had ever lived, still to this day. He was the wealthiest king at that point ever. He was extremely well. His, his money had money. He had such a reputation that people came from all over to see. The queen of Sheba came to visit him one time and was told of the great wealth that he had. And, and she even remarked that that couldn't, what they told me doesn't even compare to what I have actually seen. Solomon was a man that was wise, but he started out that way. Before the end of his life, Solomon ended up as a wreck. He went against all the wisdom that God had given him. He had followed idols himself because he began to marry women that worshipped other idols, and they got him to doing that. And here, Ecclesiastes is kind of like the last the last will and testament that Solomon wants to get to his sons and to those that, that need to hear it, the people of God. He had the ability to do whatever he wanted to, whenever he wanted to, however he wanted to do it. He had the ability, and it says in verse 2, he said, I said to myself, go ahead, I will test myself with pleasure. He is saying, I am wealthy, I can do anything I want to, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do whatever I want to. I am going to take in all of the pleasure that I can muster. I'm going to enjoy everything that is good. And then verse two, he sa- or at the end of the verse, he says, but it turned out to be futile. Futile. That's the first, that's the first answer there on your outline. Pleasure is futile. I like that word, futile. You can say it in different ways. I like saying it futile. Makes it sound even better or worse. That word that he's talking about there is a word that, that is, it may be in your translation, it may be um, translated as vanity. It may be the word worthless. The literal word there in the Hebrew is, is a breath. <sighs> You can't catch your breath, right? You can't. It, it's, he's saying that all of this that I tried, I denied myself nothing. And all of it ended up being hollow, being futile, being worthless. All of it. All of the pleasure that he experienced, everything that he allowed himself to do, it all added up to nothing. Nothing. That's a pretty drastic statement. Because he could do anything he wanted to. And he did. He did just that. But it added up to nothing. There's a common word in this also that we see, and it's a a theme throughout Ecclesiastes, is the little word, I. I. I said to myself, go ahead, I will test you. I said about laughter. I explored with my mind. I could see. You see, there's no idol that does not begin with I. No idol does not begin with I. And Solomon knows that here. He is obsessed with himself. We're going to talk about that idol in a couple of weeks, the idol of I. But you see, he is, he is obsessed with himself. His happiness, his joy is the main focus of his life. He is focusing on him and him alone. He's not asking what anybody else needs. He is focusing on himself and he is selfish. That's one thing that we can see when idols take us over. He had everything and he wanted to experience the idol of pleasure. Second Timothy Paul is is encouraging Timothy, and he's writing to him because he is leading the church at Ephesus. And he wants him to understand what's going to happen. And he writes to him this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. He says, but know this, 
Difficult times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Paul knew what he was talking about. I think we can look at all those descriptions, and, it, and I think we could probably describe ourselves with a few of those if we're not careful. But Paul wanted him to understand what was happening. You see, that wasn't something new. That was the something that is always our hearts. If we wander from the Lord, if we start to walk away from Him, then we see all of these qualities that we will begin to take up. If we focus on ourselves, as Paul says here in Timothy, and as, as, as Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes, then we see that that is when the idol of pleasure can, can sneak in. Solomon thought that pleasure and experiencing pleasure was going to answer everything that he needed in life. He thought that was it. He thought, boy, if I can just experience every pleasure, that is what life is all about. And you see, we can get into that too. Right? There are, just watch the commercials. Especially today. Super Bowl Sunday. Right? These commercials that will tell us all these things that we need, that will make us happy, that will give us pleasure that will change our lives. All of these products, all of these, these services, all these things that everyone is promising us that they will do something for us that only God can actually do for us. You see, we can get into the same thing. We can get into the idea that, boy, I just want to experience every pleasure that there is out there. Verse 10 in 11, he said, boy, I said, all that my eyes desired, I didn't deny myself. That's a pretty big statement. He says, anything that I wanted, I got. Being the richest, wealthiest, the king, the greatest king in all the land at the time, that's what happened. And he said, I did all of that. I didn't refuse myself anything. And I found everything to be futile. In a pursuit of the wind, there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Look how he came to this conclusion, verse 11. When I considered, when I considered, that word there, it's an idea that he came face to face with himself. He finally got to the point where he got tired of what was going on, and he just came face to face with himself and did a heart check. Did a heart check. How often do we, as the people of God, do a heart check? Idols begin in the heart. So how many of us need a spiritual cardiologist? Well, every one of us, and his name is Jesus. You see, if we don't consider ourselves at times, if we don't look to us and say, okay, God, what is it that I am doing? God, what have I taken in place of you? What have I loved, Father? What have I embraced that is not you? Lord, cons help me to consider my own heart. You see, if we're going to battle these idols in our hearts, we have to consider our own hearts. You see, we live in a society that wants to put blame everywhere else, boy. We need to start with us. That's what Solomon finally did. He, he saw everything that he had received, and he, he came back to it, and he said, all of it was nothing. I finally considered all that I had done and how I felt afterwards and all the experiences I had, and he was like, it was nothing. It was like chasing the wind. You can't chase the wind. There's a book Greg Easterbrook wrote. It's called The Progress Paradox, How Life Gets Better why people get worse. Interesting book. He talks about how 
We live today in a society in the most prosperous times in history. Right? We have more and experience more pleasure and have more things than ever before. Except happiness. They take a a running total, and they've been doing this since the, the 50s, I believe. The United States General Social Survey. Take it every year. And they've shown since 1972, there has been a long-term decline in happiness. And they've shown since 1988, there has been a drastic increase in unhappiness. So not only are people not happy, but they're increasingly unhappy. We are the most prosperous nation in all of the world. We have more. The poor people in our society are wealthy in other countries. Go with us to Mexico. You'll eat with this on, on dirt. You'll see them washing their plastic forks and spoons and knives. Recycling them. How a man has one or two pairs of pants. woman has three or four dresses and a couple of things. And, and they're just as happy. Just as happy. You see the message is that pleasure, any idol, does not satisfy our souls. We can have all the pleasure and all the things in the world, but that is not what satisfies our souls. We will be grasping and continue to grasp and grasp and grasp for all these other things when the answer is lying right there, right before us in Christ. Solomon Get specific here. The second thing, number two on your outline, is we're going to be naming the idols. The first thing he says in verse two, he said, I said about laughter, it is madness. The first God that we see here is the God of entertainment. The God of entertainment. Picture this with me. Okay, you ready? You arrive on a Sunday morning. The parking lots are packed. There's people camping out on the front of our sanctuary here, outside, ready to come in on a Sunday morning to worship God. And you look and there are people tailgating at the church. You arrive and it's amazing. People are tailgating and they're, they're, they're sitting around and they're eating and around campfires and, and they're talking about the sermon from last week. And, and it's just amazing when we open the doors, people just rush through the doors because they want to get the, the, the seats up front and the place just packs out. People have their faces painted. People have signs. Preach it, preacher! More worship! Get your tithe on! And we begin worship and everybody stands up and nobody sits down the whole time. And we begin to worship the Lord and, and somebody starts the wave for Jesus. It is an incredible experience. I mean, it, it is... It is extraordinary. I mean, we get through and, and people are clamoring for more. More worship. More preaching. We want more Jesus. We get through with the service and, and all of us are mobbed. A teenage girl faints because she gets Todd's autograph. But what I'm not describing is something on Sunday, am I? What I'm describing happens at football games. Basketball games. Happens at concerts. 
It's happening at the Super Bowl today. It's like another religion. Actually, there's been a professor at Penn State University that said college football, professional football are a religion. And she listed the reasons why. Because all of the things that compose a religion are all the things that compose people that are diehard fans of a team. See, we live in a time where entertainment can be our idol if we're not careful. Oh, you can just pick any kind of entertainment. It's not just sports, it's video games. Right? It is being on the internet, right? Surfing on the internet. It could be Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Just name it. It can be any kind of entertainment. It can be movies or television. It can be all these things that we want to entertain us because we have a restless heart, right? We want to just unwind. I've had such a hard day. I just need to unwind a little bit. And you reach for something and you begin to, instead of reaching for the Lord, you reach for something else. Another interesting finding that I found the other day, boredom in our society is at an all-time high. Boredom. 90% of the people that took this poll said that during the day they experience long bouts of boredom. We have entertainment at our fingertips. We have the ability now to see things that were never seen before. Movies, all kinds of things. But yet, people in America suffer from boredom. Entertainment will not fill your soul. Actually, entertainment distracts us from the real things of God. Solomon goes on, the next idol he talks about. I explored my mind how to let my body enjoy life with wine and how to grasp folly. The next idol that we see here is alcohol and food. You see, alcohol consumption is at an all-time high in the United States. All-time high. You realize that when COVID and everything hit, the end of 2019 and everything started happening in 2020, that that alcohol, everybody, they they wanted to close churches, they wanted to close all these other places, but you know what was deemed essential? Liquor stores. Do you know also that with the drastic increase of alcohol consumption at that time was also right alongside of it was a drastic increase in domestic violence, a drastic increase in child abuse, a drastic increase in alcoholism, a drastic increase in DWI and vehicular manslaughter. Now, Now all of the alcohol companies are targeting the younger generation and making all these drinks fruity and taste really good. Now, I want to say something because I don't want you to think that I'm preaching without experience. I come from a long line of alcoholics. My father was a binge alcoholic on the weekends. All of my uncles were alcoholics. I started drinking at a young age myself, secretly. So I know a little bit about this topic. He here is talking about he tried all of this and the wine. He filled himself with wine and it did nothing. Nothing. You see, the problem is today that that people have hard lives and they have difficult things that happen. It's just the world. Christians experience it, non-Christians experience their difficulties. But instead of reaching for Christ, he tells us in his word to, to cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. He tells us that. But you see, most of the people, we don't cast our cares on the Lord. We will grab for a bottle or a glass or something else and we will cast our cares upon some alcohol. 
We will let the alcohol soothe us instead of Christ Himself soothing us. Alcohol can become an idol. And if it's, now let me just give you a test. Right? Some of you are just steaming mad at me right now, I'm sure. It's okay, been there, done that. Let me just ask you this. If it's not an idol, just stop drinking. If you say, well, I'm not, it's not an idol to me, well, just don't drink anymore. How about that? And if you can just do it and just set it down and not ever taste it again, praise the Lord. It wasn't an idol. But if you keep wanting to go back to it, then you know it's got a hold of you. I took my last drink of alcohol in 1997. I was actually sitting at my table. I was single. I was doing a Bible study of all things with a glass of alcohol sitting right, right there next to me. And I believe the Lord just spoke to my heart at that moment, and He says, okay, what are you going to choose? Me or your drink? It was a moment of crisis for me. I had been drinking at that time for a long time. The Lord got a hold of my heart. I got up. I poured it out. I poured everything that I had out. And thank the Lord by His strength, I've not returned. I can't take any credit for that because I'm not strong enough. I'd realized it had been an idol. And it could be your idol too. If you reach for something to soothe your soul or to comfort you that is not the Lord, that has become an idol. Food is the same thing. If we're not careful, we will reach for the ice cream. We will reach for whatever it is that, that will soothe us. Right? We will look for all these other things and we will, instead of dealing with our hurt and our anger and all these things, we will eat ourselves out of anger and hurt. But you know, with all of these idols, the anger and the hurt and all that is still there. You see, we can take these things in our lives and see how detrimental they are to us. We look at, at food. I read an article two weeks ago that said that if America got into a war right now, we would be in trouble because there is a high percentage of our young men and women that are overweight. We, are, we would not be prepared for any kind of battle with anybody. You look at the effects of food on our society, right? Diabetes is sky high right now. Right? All these things. I read one article, it's been a couple of months ago, but talked about if, if everyone actually got back to their ideal weight, we would very seldom have any of these pills to take. Right? The majority of the things that we suffer from are due to the fact that we have food as an idol. Now, now hear me. I'm not saying that we can't enjoy a good meal. That's not the truth. The truth is, if we turn to food as something to comfort us and give us hope and joy, then we are making an idol of it. Another thing that we see here, that we see as the, a God of pleasure, is sex. Verse 10, all that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all of my struggles. If you don't know the story about Solomon, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Or it switched. 300 wives, 700. Either way, it's a bunch. <laughs> we live in a society that is sex-driven. There are sexual innuendos in hamburger commercials. I mean, you just look and, and all the things. And, and the, the problem is we've become so conditioned to it. We don't even see it anymore. 
right? That there's sex everywhere. But you see, the problem is that now we live in a time where sex is not just out there. You had to go, when I was a kid, you'd had, they put all the dirty magazines at the gas station behind the, and you had to like have the guts to go ask. <laughs> but nowadays you can just pull out your phone or your iPad or whatever it is, and you can just dial it up for free. Pornography is rampant in our society. It is a demeaning of not only men and women. It is demeaning the image of God in us. You see, sex, God gave us sex in the context of marriage, and he, he designed it to be good and pleasurable and all of that, and that's where it is designed to stay. But outside of that context, there's only destruction and problems that go along with it. I found some incredible statistics. Pornography just in America is a $16 billion industry. $16 billion. Now that is only on the sites that pay for it. They estimate that if you actually, because there's a whole lot of places that I understand you can get it for free. If they charged on those free sites, it could very well go up to $32 to, to $40 billion. 10% of Americans, they estimate, are addicted to pornography. That means you can't go a day without looking at it. Just to give you a little bit of a, a, a number, 38, that means 38 to 40 million people are addicted to pornography. They have to see it every day. They found with all the research that pornography, these are, these are the, the things that pornography will get you. Depression. Anxiety. Social anxiety. Memory problems. Higher instances of drug abuse and alcohol abuse. Sexual dysfunction. It actually rewires your brain. People that look at porn, and let me just make this clear, it's not just men. It's been shown that at least a third of all the people that are addicted are women. It's everybody. But it actually, they found that it rewires the brain. And so the people who partake of the pornography, they actually can't anymore experience physical sex. Because they have rewired their brain in such a way that the only thing that can pleasure them is on a screen. Also, with those that are in, involved in pornography, there is a high incidence of sexual assault and rape. You see, sex can be a wonderful thing in a marriage. Outside of that, it is not intended to be there, and especially in pornography. If you are addicted, even if you look at pornography, I implore you, for the sake of your own soul, stop it. Stop it. If you could do something every day, and you would be guaranteed to be depressed and anxious and have an increased instance of suicide and suicidal thoughts, and you would have an increase, increased ability to, to have physical problems, how many people would sign up for that? But that's the truth of the matter. Pleasure. We cannot give away our intimacy. And what the problem is, is people will seek out that intimacy with God because our intimacy with God is the, is the most intimate connection that we have. It is more intimate than a marriage. That's why God compares the love that he has for us between the love of a husband and a wife. That's why the church is described as the bride of Christ. That intimacy that we have. And that's what it does. You have a, you have a desire for a connection a deep and intimate connection, and you try to seek something else that will, that for the moment gives you a connection, but that connection wears out, and you got to keep connecting in that way. 
You see, all of these idols that we'll be exploring, those today, is we are the only way that we can be satisfied is in Christ. God Himself is the one that satisfies us. It is not the entertainment because the entertainment wears off. You get to your high score, then you go on to another, and you just you just get rid of that game, and then you go on, you do this, and, you, and the, it, it just becomes boring. You see, all of these gods of entertainment do not produce anything good in our lives when they become idols. 1500, Hideyoshi, he was a Japanese warlord who ruled over all of Japan. He wanted a statue of Buddha built so that he could put it in the shrine in downtown Kyoto. So he commissioned 50,000 men to to carve this statue of Buddha. And it took them five years, 50,000 men, five years, to, to carve this huge statue of Buddha. They got it placed in the temple in Kyoto. Under a year later, there was an earthquake. The roof fell in on the temple. The grand carving was fallen and shattered into pieces. They said that Hideyoshi, who was a man of, of war, he took his arrow, his bow and arrow, and he shot his bow and arrow at what was left of the carving. And he said, I put you here at great expense, and you can't even look after your own temple. That's the way the idols are in our life. We put them in our lives at great expense. And they cannot even take care of your own temple. The last thing that we need to see, turn with me over to Isaiah chapter 58, the good news that we have for anyone embracing idols. Isaiah 58, beginning in verse 13. If you keep, desec if you keep yourself from desecrating the Sabbath from doing whatever you want on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, seeking your own pleasure or talking too much, then you will delight yourself in the Lord. And I will make you ride over the heights of the land and let you enjoy the heritage of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Israel had become idol worshipers. In, in doing that, they denied the Lord. He tells, in the, he tells us that we need to have a Sabbath every week, right? Setting aside an entire day to worship God. And he said, because they were worshiping idols, they no longer held the Sabbath as holy. And so in the midst of that, they experienced drought and trouble. They had been invaded by by different countries. And all of these things were happening because they neglected the one true God and they were claiming for themselves these idols made of wood, stone, gold, and silver. Isaiah, through what the Lord is saying here, he said, if you will just get back to the Sabbath, worshiping me and honoring me only. Right? If you will do this, he said, I will show you what it means to have true delight. The third thing on your listening outline, real pleasure is found in God alone. Amen. He says here, he said, if you will stop doing whatever you want on my holy day, if you will call the Sabbath a delight, and then the holy day is honorable, if you'll honor it, not going your own way, not seeking your own pleasure or talking too much, he says, then then I will delight, then you will delight yourself in the Lord, and I will make you ride over the heights of the land. Look what the Lord is saying here. If you will come back to me, if you will get rid of the idols, if you will just focus on me, then, then you will delight yourself. That word delight is a, is a word that is it's rich. It means deep pleasure. It means Joy that you can't explain. It means true happiness. All those things that 
us as humans seek out and we gather idols for ourselves to comfort ourselves or to give us peace or happiness or joy. And he says, if you will just come back to me and honor my Sabbath as holy, if you will honor me, then you will delight yourself in the Lord. You will find joy. You will find deep pleasure. You will find happiness that is real and lasting in me. And not only that, I will make you ride over the heights of the land. That is the idea of someone who is victorious after battle. You ride over the heights of the land and you look at all that has been conquered. And you are victorious. He says, I will give you the true delight. I will give you the true pleasure that you so desire. I will give you the victory over all of these things that you've gathered for yourself. But you just have to turn back to me. You see, all of these all of these idols that we've seen today and that we will see in the future in these next weeks, you see, they are all trying to fulfill a natural desire that God has given us. A desire to, to know peace and, and love and joy and all of those things. But He is the only one that can give us those things that are real and lasting. You see, the Lord is so good to us that He allows us to even go astray. But He's always there for us to come back to. Until we find that God is our greatest pleasure. You see, all the other pleasures that we seek are empty, hollow, futile, worthless. You see, the beauty today is that of all the things that we can think of that we have gathered for ourselves as idols in our hearts, the Lord can change that. The truth of the matter is, is it begins with Christ. If you don't know Christ today, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord, then you don't know how, how the freedom and victory happen. Because that only happens in Christ. You see, we have to understand that we are sinners apart from God. Born that way. We can't get to the Lord by church membership or baptism or by being good. We can't get to the Lord by reading enough of our Bible and coming to church enough Sundays a month and all that. It is only by coming to know Christ as our Savior and Lord can we know the victory and the freedom that God gives us. You see, the truth of the matter is this, is that Jesus is the very Son of God. He came and He died on the cross. He took the wrath of God for every sin that we have and would commit. Every person. And it killed Him on the cross. They buried Him in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, He was resurrected back to life. To prove that He is the God that He says He was. 